Man, I love this movie. The music was absolutely fantastic. And after watching the bonus features on the Blu-ray, I'm excited to say that there are new types of Mexican music that I've never heard of before that I now get to go out and discover for myself. And I love that they actually found a kid with experience singing this type of music. And I mean, I really love that they actually rigged up the guitars and maintained as much accuracy with the live performances as possible. That was awesome. And even just the way this movie looks, I love the visuals, the colors. I really like the towers of buildings in the Land of the Dead. But there's one part of this film that really stuck with me. I'm not sure if Pixar hired a music therapist to write this scene, but this scene is like real. So I'm going to have to get a little serious here, more serious than usual, because this is a serious real world issue. But it looks like Coco has dementia. She has trouble getting around and is really stuck to being in her chair. It looks like she has trouble eating and relies on others to take care of her. And it seems like she has difficulty understanding what's going on in her immediate surroundings. Papa is home. Mama. Calmese. Calmese. Papa is coming home. No, mama. It also seems like she has a lot of trouble with her memory, as demonstrated by her inability to remember Miguel's name. How are you, Julio? Actually, my name is Miguel. Mama Coco has trouble remembering things. I'm here. Who are you? Dementia is a category of brain diseases that causes long-term degradation of a person's ability to think and function, and it is brutal. Now I know that this scene looks like some Disney Pixar magic where Miguel plays a special song and magically Coco remembers everything around her by the power of music, but this is actually a real thing that's happening in the world of music therapy, and in all honesty, it really does look like magic. Hi Papa. Huh? How you doing? I'm alright. I'm fine. Who, Wait. Who am I? I don't know. Yeah. Henry. Yes, yeah, so. I found your music. Uh -huh. You want you want your music now? And immediately, he, he lights up, his face assumes expression, his eyes open wide. The trick to this type of music therapy is, you have to bypass the weaker memory connection in the brain by using the patient's emotional center. One of the first parts of the brain that tends to degrade first when you're looking at somebody with dementia is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is important in converting short-term memories to long-term memories. This is why many patients with dementia, Coco included, really suffer when it comes to memory. But there's another part of the brain called the amygdala that's associated with emotions and emotional learning. If you've ever had a bad experience, your amygdala remembers that bad experience and turns it into a fear or anxiety. But on the other hand, any happy experiences go on to become happy memories. The more intense the emotional experience, the more likely the person is to retain that emotional memory. And what they found is that people with dementia can compensate for a weaker prefrontal hippocampal connection through the use of a prefrontal amygdala connection. In other words, people with dementia can compensate for a weaker memory by utilizing their emotional center and accessing their emotionally encoded memories. And music offers a direct line to that emotional center. But what gets even more crazy is that the effects of listening to music can last after the music has ended. Yeah. I'm gonna take the music for one second, okay? Just huh? to ask you a few questions. Did you play music when you were, uh, were you, did you like music when you were young? Yes, yes, I went to big dances and things. By stimulating the emotional center of their brain, the individual regains access to memories and cognitive functions that they had otherwise lost. Which is exactly what happens in this scene with Coco. As soon as she hears the piece of music she associates with the happy memories of her father, she suddenly regains her ability to communicate and remembers her collection of letters from her father, even after Miguel stops playing. Take note, she specifically remembers how beautiful the music was because she's feeling her memories. When I was a little girl, he and Mama would sing such beautiful songs. But this scene also demonstrates something significant in Miguel as well. Miguel is 12 years old, and the interesting thing about Miguel is that he's about to establish what type of music he's probably going to like for the rest of his life. Miguel is almost a teenager, and what we'd call an adolescent, and there are a few things about the adolescent mind that are important to understand. First, there's your prefrontal cortex, or the part of your brain that's responsible for rational thought and planning, and it doesn't completely come in until you're about 25 years old. That's why you can see Miguel doing really stupid things, like breaking into a graveyard to steal a guitar. The rational part of his brain still isn't totally developed. Now, if you saw my video on the four chords, then you'll know how music can trigger a reaction in the reward center of the brain. The mesolimbic pathway, or the reward pathway, is a series of connections in the brain that are responsible for making you feel better after you receive a rewarding stimulus. It's your brain saying, hey, we need to make sure that we do that thing again, so let's make us feel good so we do it again. This is what makes things like food and money so enjoyable. They're critical to our survival, so our brain makes us like them more. At the same time, drugs like cocaine light this part of your brain up like a Christmas tree, and if you ever go overboard in short 
short circuit your mesolimbic pathway, you can end up with some sort of addiction, even if it isn't directly drug related. And this system relies on a neurotransmitter called dopamine in order to function. Think of it like the fuel that your mesolimbic pathway needs to work. And it's worth mentioning that this system can not only elicit an intense emotional response, but it's also connected to the hippocampus, amygdala, and prefrontal cortex. Now I tell you all this because this whole system is completely haywire in an adolescent mind. Teenagers have a highly sensitive nucleus accumbens, which is a critical part of this mesolimbic pathway. And at the same time, they have lower levels of dopamine in their system. This is why teenagers are always bored unless they're doing something really stimulating. They don't have a lot of dopamine in their system, but when they experience something exciting and pleasurable enough to elicit a response in their reward center, it's a more intense experience than what you might see in a child or an adult. That intense incentive for exciting and pleasurable experiences combined with an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex or rational thinking center is what makes teenagers so vulnerable to things like drugs, alcohol, and ending up on YouTube. But if listening to music can guarantee a dopamine response in the reward center of your brain, and you're currently in a time of your life where you're generally running low on dopamine but also have an overly sensitive reward center, then that kind of seems like an easy way to feel better all the time. But while that's all happening, the teenager's brain is going through a burst of synaptogenesis with a combination of dendritic pruning and myelination. In other words, a teenager's brain is rewiring itself based on new experiences. So what happens is, you get a teenager listening to a piece of music and thinking, oh wow, that was great, I'm gonna do it again. And then their brain says, oh wow, that was great, I'm gonna strengthen those connections to make it easier for this type of musical stimulation to give us that reward response. The TLDR is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If a specific piece or type of music can give you a positive experience, then why would you pursue any other type of music? This is exactly what Seth Stevens Davidowitz found in his New York Times article titled, The Songs That Bind. He found that people tended to gravitate toward the music that they listened to as a young teenager. He found that the critical age of influence was 13 for women and 14 for men, probably because women go through puberty slightly earlier than men. And this also explains why when I ask my Twitter followers for their favorite guilty pleasure song, and their age, you can see that what a lot of people identify as their favorite guilty pleasure song actually came out and was playing on the radio when they were a young teenager. I would argue that even if you don't listen to the exact same type of music that you used to listen to as a teenager, then you probably listen to music with a very similar structure. Because the more you listen to that specific type or genre of music, the better your brain is going to be at looking at where it can interpret those rewards that are going to be in that specific piece or genre of music. Now that doesn't mean you can theoretically change your taste in music if you wanted to. The whole idea of neuroplasticity is that your brain can rewire itself based on what's going on around it. But for most people, when it comes to music, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. At the same time, there's some evidence to suggest that certain parts of your prefrontal cortex have something to do with your ability to process more complicated musical structures, which would explain why children's music tends to be so simple. But if teenagers also have an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, but at the same time have a hypersensitive reward center with an absence of dopamine, then they aren't gonna have the attention or motivation to pursue more complex forms of music. They're gonna want whatever reward they can get as fast as possible. Which, if this really is the time in your life where you solidify your taste in music, then it offers an explanation as to how the four chords have managed to remain steadfast over the course of generations, but you still don't find a lot of people nowadays just raving about their favorite ligety etude. But if you're a preteen who isn't allowed to listen to music at home, then the only music that you could possibly get attached to would be whatever music you might be able to hear out on the streets or in the plaza, or whatever you managed to get on the VHS tapes that you smuggled into your attic. But with that increased emotional response, their amygdala will be more likely to encode intense emotional memories, the kind of memories that you would want to access in a patient with dementia. What was your favorite music when you were young? Well, I guess, uh, well, Cab Calloway was my number one band guy. I like. That did the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy. So that's why I love this scene in Coco. On one hand, it's Miguel playing the piece of music that Hector wrote so Coco wouldn't forget about him while he was out traveling. And Coco, hearing that music, suddenly remembers the letters from her father. But on the other hand, Miguel is having a deeply emotional experience encoded in the same part of his brain that's being accessed in Coco's, with a piece of music written by Miguel's great-great-grandfather that will probably result in a reaction in Miguel's reward center for the rest of his life. This is a really poetic musical moment where the family comes together, which is what this movie is all about. Remember, our brains work by forming connections, which is why I spend so much time talking about light motifs. Remember me. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank all my patrons for making these videos possible. With a very special thank you to Anna Birch, AFN Matt, Ben Liebschfager, Ethan Rooney, Florian Erchger, and Hayden Elza. If you like what you saw here, be sure to subscribe and check out my other videos. Follow me on Twitter and Twitch to have your musical questions answered live. And if you really like what I'm doing, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. And if you're interested to know more about the science behind this video, you can find all my sources in the description below. But that's going to be it for me for now. 
Thanks for watching. Remember me. <laughs> Brings back memory.